Good afternoon and welcome or welcome back to the third installment of our virtual conference, Voting Matters, Gender, Citizenship and the Long 19th Amendment. My name is Susan Ware and I am the Honorary Women's Suffrage Centennial Historian at the Schlesinger Library, as well as a member of the steering committee of the Long 19th Amendment Project generously underwritten by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. In addition to thanking them and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, we extend a special welcome to members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all of our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. So when Jane Kamensky, Corey Field, and Lisa Tetro and I originally sat down to plan this conference, we decided to organize it around six key moments in the larger history of gender and citizenship. When the global pandemic disrupted our plans to gather in person, this structure proved remarkably adaptable to our new normal uh, by offering six discrete virtual sessions, each of which could stand on its own, but whose sum would be larger than the parts. Previously, we explored origin stories which challenged 1848 as the traditional starting point for suffrage history. Next, we widened our lens in 1870 beyond the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments to explore Native American history, Chinese restriction, and African American women's activism. Today, we have landed in 1920. And if there is any question about how seriously we take our mandate to explore the long 19th Amendment, remember that we still have three sessions to go. So please stay tuned. While the title for this session is inspired by the language of the 19th Amendment that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex, be forewarned that you are not going to hear much about the actual struggle to win the vote. Our aspirations are broader, to explore a range of themes and issues surrounding citizenship and enfranchisement in the aftermath of the 19th Amendment. So get ready to range widely over questions of legal history, voting and the carceral state, disfranchisement and access to the polls, race and immigration status, conservative women, and much more. So here is how we're going to proceed. From the very start, we conceived of this session as one devoted to what we call big ideas. Um, and that was the charge that we presented to our panelist, panelists. The first three speakers will explore patterns of exclusion and restriction related to gender and citizenship and will feature remarks by Mei Nye, the Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History at Columbia University, Kathleen Cahill, Associate Professor of History at Pens Pennsylvania State University, and Sarah Haley, Associate Professor of Gender Studies and African American Studies at UCLA, who joins us through pre-recorded remarks. At that point, our moderator, Professor Corinne Field of the University of Virginia will facilitate a short discussion with Nye and Cahill before moving on to the second group of remarks loosely organized around the theme of transformations and possibilities that played out in the aftermath of the 19th Amendment. Here we will hear from Reva Siegel, Nicholas Katzenbach Professor of Law at Yale Law School, Christina Hoff Summers, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and Don Langan Teal, the Janice and Julian Bears Assistant Professor in the Social Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. Then Corey Field will pop up again to engage those three in a brief discussion before we open the floor to questions. We encourage those watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time during the session. With such a rich program, we anticipate a lot of questions. So we ask you to keep them short so that we can address as many as we have time for. And now it is my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to May Nye. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Susan, and the Radcliffe Institute for this kind invitation to participate uh, in the panel today. What I want to talk about today is a baseline issue, which is that voting is a right of citizenship. So that's my big concept, citizenship. Now, historically, there have been some exceptions of non-citizens voting in local elections, but in general, voting is a function of citizenship. As a rule, non-citizens, that is immigrants, do not have access to the franchise. They must first become a citizen by naturalization. Now, just a word about citizenship uh, and voting. Voting is one of a very few number of rights and privileges that distinguish citizenship from non-citizenship. Another is the right to be present territorially, that is, the right to not be deported. A third is a right to social welfare, although this is varied according to, um, over time, according to uh, local and federal laws. Uh, for most of American history, eligibility for social welfare was not based on citizenship, but was means tested. But since the late 20th century, it has been both. So full assessment of women's right to vote has to consider the relationships between citizenship, gender, race, and marriage. The 19th Amendment gave women the vote, but women's citizenship was still not their own. In 1920, a woman's citizenship was determined by her fathers or by her husbands. That goes back to an 1855 law that stipulated that an immigrant woman who married a citizen man automatically became a citizen as long as she was white or after the Civil War, black. But that 1855 law was silent on the status of US born women who married non-citizen men, the inverse, so to speak, until 1907, when Congress passed a law stipulating that a US citizen woman who married a non-citizen man lost her American citizenship and acquired the foreign citizenship of her husband. Let me just repeat that. A U.S. citizen woman who married a non-citizen man lost her American citizenship and acquired the foreign citizenship of her husband. Now, after passage of the 19th Amendment, women's rights activists sought to remedy this sex discrimination in citizenship. So in 1922, just two years after uh, the 19th Amendment was ratified, Congress passed the Cable Act, formerly known as the Married Women's Independent Nationality Act. And that should tell you what the substance of that act was. The Cable Act aimed to transform daughters and wives into independent political subjects. But again, that transformation was cross-cut and limited by racial exclusions in immigration and citizenship law. So on the positive side, the Cable Act restored citizenship to American women who had lost it by marrying a non-citizenship, although they would have to naturalize to reclaim it. But that did not apply to Asian American women who had lost their citizenship through marriage because they were still deemed to be racially ineligible for naturalized citizenship under the Asian exclusion laws. That exclusion was not remedied until 1936 when Congress repealed that section of the Cable Act and provided that all women were citizen, who were citizens at birth had the right to reclaim it. It also provided the right to naturalization to all women who were racially eligible regardless of their marriage status and the racial eligibility of their husbands. But here, local courts often deny naturalization to foreign-born women. For example, in California, Mexican women who are married to South Asian men. As a consequence, Mexican Sikh families could not own agricultural property in California under the state's alien land laws. Now, recognizing women's independent nationality status also meant that it was harder for non-citizen women to enter the United States as immigrants, even if they had a husband who was a citizen or a permanent resident in the United States. The National Origin uh, Quota Law of 1924 was originally designed to treat all would-be immigrants as independent subjects, male and female, each one subject to their country's quota. That reversed a long-standing practice of immigration by family units and led to the separation of families. But political pressure put, uh, and litigation led to the 1924 Act providing for non-quota admission, that is admission above and beyond the quotas, 
of wives and children of American citizen men. Now that was understood to be the right of a male citizen to have his family with him, not a right of a non-citizen wife. And of course the wife still had to meet the racial and other requirements for entry. That structure still exists in current immigration law, which allows for the non-quota admission of spouses and minor children. So in summary, if we think about the citizenship, uh, the baseline requirement of voting is, is citizenship, we can see that while the 19th Amendment certainly gave that right to American citizen women, that right proved to be elusive to American citizen women who married non-citizen men, especially Asian American women who lost it permanently until World War II, when the Asian exclusion laws began to fall. So finally, I just want to make a comment about naturalization. Since the early 20th century, immigrants have generally had very low rates of naturalization. Europeans and Mexicans who were eligible to become citizens tended not to apply, both to sustain their ties to their homelands and because they perceived little benefit in the United States where most of them work in low wage and low skilled jobs. Now, what I think is interesting is that there were two notable spikes in naturalization in the 20th century. In the late 1920s, when becoming a citizen allowed one to immigrate one's family members, and in the 1990s, when one had to be a citizen to access Medicaid, SSI, and other benefits. Now, today, we are again seeing an increase in naturalization. And I think that is actually directly related to the vote. Immigrants are fearful of nativist policies, deportations, and even greater exclusions from public benefits and other threats. But unlike uh, other spurts in naturalization today, we are seeing also new citizens registering to vote. And this is so important at a time when our right to vote has never seemed so threatened um, and concerned with it. And it's worth noting too that in the last 15 years or so, Immigrants are now mostly women, so it's a fitting way to connect the question of immigration, citizenship, women, and the vote. So thank you, and it's my pleasure now to pass the virtual floor to Kathleen. Thank you, May. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you. That was very interesting. So I'm really uh, thrilled to be here. Um, for those of you who saw Dr. Amanda Cobb's terrific presentation in the previous episode um, of this conference, uh, you know that Native nations are sovereign nations. Um, and you also know that after 1871, the federal government ended diplomatic relations with those sovereign governments and instead began to treat individual Native people as legal wards of the government who were not yet fit for American citizenship, for US citizenship. Um, in order to make them fit for US citizenship, uh, the government began to implement a policy that became known as assimilation. Now this was a complex policy uh, that was essentially designed to destroy indigenous polities and communities, and again, assimilate native people into the nation as individuals. And it relied on three broad aspects. And I'm happy to go into these in detail later, but essentially uh, one was the breaking up of tribally held and treaty protected lands um, and privatizing them. Two, the development of a boarding school system that removed native children from their communities. And three, a series of laws that outlawed um, cultural practices. And then again, the federal government also stopped recognizing tribal governments um, though that did not mean that Native people stopped recognizing their nations. So in this period, the U.S. government saw citizenship as a binary choice. Um, you were either a U.S. citizen or you were a member of a Native nation uh, they were trying to get rid of, and of course they wanted you to choose U.S. citizenship. But many Native people did reject that in, because they were told it was a choice, one or the other. So in my uh, research, I've looked at uh, Native women who refused this binary and who advocated for what Muscogee Creek scholar Shanina Lomawaima has called a layered citizenship. And I look um, at the way uh, Indigenous women were theorizing um, political uh, ideas and were articulating a system in which they could maintain their indigenous governments and treaty rights, as well as have a political voice um, in the United States. 
And that these women become involved in uh, the larger conversations around women's suffrage isn't surprising because it's precisely in the suffrage movement where there was a national conversation around uh, reimagining the contours of citizenship and rights. Uh, so this was the perfect place to sort of plug in. So um, before 1920, these native suffragists were contributing to these national conversations about women's suffrage by often um, articulating an alternative vision of women's social and political roles. And you can see from these images here, they're pointing to uh, indigenous matriarchal traditions and the Haudenosaunee um, were of particular interest. And white suffragists are very intrigued by this, had been a long time. This means that native women get a wide audience. Um, and so once they are in front of this audience and on these platforms, uh, they turn to educating those uh, white women about the contemporary challenges faced in their indigenous communities. Um, they pointed to uh, a lack of health care on reservations, right? A strikingly similar parallel uh, between the flu epidemic in 1918 and our own day. Uh, they talked about uh, Native people's lack of access to their bank accounts, as these were under the control of federal bureaucrats, the loss of land due to federal assimilation policies, and their lack of political voices as right, legal wards. Um, Gertrude Bonin is one of the women I'll talk about, also um, often pointed out that Native men, uh, including many of those who were serving their country or the country in the World War, also were not considered American citizens. So despite having been actually quite visible um, before 1920, uh, the 19th Amendment did not enfranchise many Native women, or men for that matter. In that year, fully one third of all Native adults uh, remained legally wards of the government um, and they could not vote. So Native uh, suffragists uh, keep fighting uh, for their right to politically participate. Um, 1920 is the year that Laura Cornelius Kellogg, um, a Wisconsin Oneida woman, published her book pictured here, Our Democracy and the American Indian. And she lays out this political vision of how the Oneida could maintain their lands um, and engage as a political entity with the United States. I mean, she uses the model, a, a corporate model, a corporation, um, in order to talk about these things. It's also in 1920 that she begins to uh, take a new strategy, which is moving away from the vote and towards litigation, uh, which is a strategy that many um, indigenous nations would use over the course of the 20th century. Um, Gertrude Bonin, who's pictured here on one of her pamphlets, um, or or is it Kalasa, a Yankan Dakota woman, um, who also used her own uh, nation to uh, articulate a political theory of this multi-layered citizenship. Um, after 1920, she continues to engage with uh, white women, newly enfranchised white women, and urging them to keep fighting for their Indian sisters, um, as she put it. Uh, she speaks to the National National Women's Party Conference in February of 1921, uh, but finds them not as interested in pursuing this. But the General Federation of Women's Clubs, whom she also spoke to that year, uh, becomes strong allies for Native women in the fight for citizenship, um, or what she, uh, as she termed it, the quest to Americanize the first Americans. And her title is really um, highlighting the absurdity that the indigenous people of the America, of North America were disenfranchised in their own land. Um, she used this visual often in these years to, uh, again, describe her uh, idea of how Native nations could articulate with the United States. And as you see, she says uh, they were, um, she was emphasizing a desire for tribal self-governance or democracy, and the center of the right-hand circle uh, shows a direct connection between local indigenous communities and uh, the United States, um, skipping the state levels in South Dakota, I might add. Um, and they wanted that instead of this bureaucracy or wardship that they currently lived under. Um, the passage of the Schneider Act in 1924 came partially as a result of Bonin's activity, and she's optimistic about uh, Indian people's political power. Um, 
she, you can see, publishes the pamphlet on the right that emphasizes the native populations in certain states, emphasizing that they could form a, a voting bloc to um, influence policy. Uh, white politicians also worry about the idea that Native people might form a voting bloc, and they moved quickly in the 1920s to shut this down by passing a series of laws, many of which are based on Jim Crow uh, style laws, but some of which are based on Native people's relationship to the federal government to disenfranchise Native people. And this disenfranchisement lasts um, until the post-World War II period when veterans returning from the war um, uh, start a series of court cases, but also uh, the Voting Rights Act helps uh, with this disenfranchisement as well. So uh, I want to just conclude by pointing out that 2018 saw some really important firsts for Native women uh, being elected to Congress and state offices, uh, but it's also important to remember that Native voters continue to be the targets of disenfranchisement, especially uh, with the removal of the preclearance sections of the Voting Rights Act um, in the Shelby v. Holder case, but also through these uh, race neutral laws that many Western states like North Dakota uh, have recently passed. So thank you for the, listening to that quick overview. I'm now going to virtually pass the floor to our video of Sarah Haley. I'm very glad for the opportunity to participate in this important conversation. And my deep thanks uh, goes to Dean Tamiko Brown Nagin, Jane Kamensky, Rebecca Wasserman, Amy Montilli, and all of the Radcliffe staff for the invitation and for making this possible despite the pandemic logistical challenges. Since my time is very brief today, I can only really offer a provocation about what I believe 19th century Black women's history teaches us about the present fight for suffrage. So I'll launch right in. What if we determine the measure of women's political participation and the barriers they face to the vote from the vantage point of the would-be voter in a jail cell? And I um, will speak today about jail very specifically and literally. To do so would mean we would agree with Black women organizers in the 19th century, who, as Martha Jones reminds us, believed that suffrage alone was too narrow a goal. We would find, at the very least, new violent continuities in the failures of suffrage in 1920 and 2020. In 1898, Mary Church Terrell, co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women, famously addressed the National American Women's Suffrage Association anniversary meeting, declaring, against the convict lease system whose atrocities have been frequently exposed of late, colored women here and there in the South are waging a ceaseless war. She centered Black people forced to dwell in cells she called the size of a good-sized grave. Referring to the rape of imprisoned Black women, she told her audience of suffragists that she and her comrades in the NACW hoped to touch the conscience of the country so that the stain upon its escutcheon shall forever be wiped away. What Terrell did so presciently in 1898 that reverberates loudly today is to tether our understanding of enfranchisement and both the NACW and NASA's work to the carceral state, to gendered systems of captivity and carceral violence. For the rest of my brief comments, I'll focus on the relationship between gendered political repression and one location within the carceral regime, the jail. Today, we hear widely stati cited statistics that one in 13 Black Americans and this is sometimes cited as one in 13 Black men, is precluded from voting because of a felony. And recently in states across the country, there has been amazing organizing to combat laws that prevent formerly incarcerated people from voting until their legal fines are paid, a continuity of Jim Crow. Another continuity of Jim Crow disfranchisement is the disproportionate incarceration of Black women in jail specifically. In Atlanta in the late 19th century, for example, Black women would be forced to break rocks to pave city streets or clean the city stockade for municipal crimes, for theft or quality of life offenses like using profanity in public or throwing dirty water in the street. And they served sentences ranging from a few days to nearly a year in local stockades, then jails. In 
1893, black women were six times more likely than white women to be arrested in Atlanta, and most of those arrests were for municipal crimes. Already, of course, legally barred from voting, the criminal legal system was a regime of control of everyday black women's lives. Um, and that include, right, includes cultural, social, economic, and political life. The de jure prosecution of black women for everyday actions was also a de facto technology of political control, hampering the fight for legal voting rights. And the widespread system of black women's dis disparate imprisonment extended into the early 1940s, well after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Today, the criminal legal system is arguably an even more prominent system of disenfranchisement. As prisonpolicy.org reports, in stark contrast to the total incarcerated population, where the state prison system holds twice as many people as are held in jails, more incarcerated women are held in jails than in state prisons. And this is largely because um, women's um, salaries um, are lower than men's, and so uh, they are less able to make money bail. As foundational scholars of Black women's political history have demonstrated, and I'm thinking here about the work of Elsa Barkley Brown, Hazel Carby, Sharon Harley, Darlene Clark Hine, Evelyn Higginbotham, Nell Painter, Rosalind Turgwork Penn, just to name only a few, um, the, they have demonstrated that employing racialized gender as a framework of analysis is crucial. In this case, allowing us to see the carceral system in relation to suffrage differently. In the convict leasing era, state and misdemeanor and felony camps um, were the focus of virtually all of the research and activism, and for many good reasons. But, but the daily policing of Black women's social, political, and economic life through the courts was effaced. Today, women comprise about 100,000 um, of the approximately 600,000 people in local jails. At least 470,000 of those are eligible to vote because they have not been convicted of a crime. And although most statistics of LGBT prisoners emerge jail and prison rates, we know that the grossly disproportionate rates of um, queer and trans imprisonment, it makes um, that extend to jails as well. Incarcerated women who have lower incomes than men, as I said, have a hard time affording money bail. And voting in jail, particularly for women in um, jails across the country, there was a recent uh, expose about this in LA, um, who are facing pandemic rates of abuse, assault, and sexual violence. All of this makes um, voting extremely difficult, more difficult, of course, today, um, where there is a health crisis. So just as Mary Church Charles insisted that the rape of imprisoned Black women was an issue for suffrage in 1898, today the Me Too Behind Bars movement needs to be understood as central to the fight for the vote. There are initiatives to reduce barriers to voting in jail based on findings from the sentencing project that very few people in jail can vote. Um, and there are movements to implement reforms such as access to mail mail-in ballots or uh, more available jail-based voting centers and the League of Women Voters has advertised a toolkit about this. But of course, the only way to remove jail as a gendered barrier to voting is freedom from jail, is to remove the jail as a barrier itself. So movements such as the Black Mama Bailout um, campaign and other bailout campaigns, though rarely discussed this way, should be seen as modern suffrage organizations. This makes Radcliffe's long historic graphic framework um, crucial. We see in it a genealogy from Sojourner Truth to abolitionists such as Angela Davis or Ruthie Gilmore and organizations whose work is to hashtag free them all. And this is the horizon for the unfinished project of suffrage um, and realizing suffrage within a justice-based framework rather than a rights-based framework which is always arbitrated in terms of those variously included or excluded. Under this genealogy, abolition would be the foundation and necessary precondition for universal political enfranchisement. 
under this genealogy, it's unpersuasive to deny people the rights to vote um, based on current imprisonment, based on um, the current serving of time for acts of harm. Because under this genealogy, we see um, questions of harm differently. We um, see questions of um, harm as central to um, the experience of both, both the experience of harm and the perpetration of harm as central to how we might think of who is enfranchised to vote on the making of laws, vote on the passage um, and continuity of laws. So as in the 19th century, abolition remains a necessary precondition for the expansion of suffrage um, and a necessary precondition for um, gendered equality under the rubric of suffrage. Thank you. Thank you so much for those fascinating presentations. I've, I've learned so much. You've really helped me understand um, the exclusions and limitations of women's suffrage and also the continuities that the 19th Amendment enabled. So um, I want to encourage the audience to keep asking questions in the Q&A, but I'm going to kick off with a first question for this group. And what I'm curious about is if you see these issues embedded in the text of the 19th Amendment itself, which Amy will put up into the chat function for everybody to see, but it's very short, so I will read it. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So Sarah, if she were here, might point to the way that this language defines voting as a right instead of a matter of justice. I'm wondering how both of you, Kathleen and May, might shift this language to enable new understandings of public life. So I want you to pretend for a minute that in 1919, you were on a congressional committee with lots of power chairing that committee and wanted to propose a uh, revision to this amendment. I'm curious um, what revision you might propose and why. And May, I'd like to pass the virtual floor to you first and then ask you to please turn to Kathleen. Thank you. Um, that's really a provocative question because the first sentence of the amendment says the rights of citizens. And I would say, let's strike that. Let's say the right of persons to vote. Why should voting be limited to citizens? Now, that might sound weird to people, but let's remember that in the Constitution, uh, rights that are enumerated in the Bill of Rights and in the 14th Amendment, right to due process and equal treatment, are for all persons. They're not just for citizens. The Bill of Rights applies to all persons. So non-citizens have the same rights as citizens under the Constitution, um, such as the freedom of speech and assembly, protection from unwanted search and seizure, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now, of course, we know that in practice these are often violated. But my point is that, from a constitutional perspective, there's no reason why voting should be limited to citizens. So that's what I would say. But I wouldn't be sitting there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, I mean, that's exactly that's a really interesting question. Very provocative. I do think, um, as with May, uh, you could change it to persons or uh, you know, residents, people who are living um, in this space, but um, it does imply, again, for Native people, the sense that if they were denied uh, U.S. citizenship or if it was going to be this binary choice, which many of them uh, did not, would were not interested in giving up their citizenship in their own nations and continue today, right? And many uh, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy refuse to vote in U.S. elections because they don't want to give it legitimacy over their, um, over them. So, uh, you know, if you changed it in a way to say persons or residents um, of the agreed upon boundaries, it would work. I think it says citizens, though, because that is, you know, what they meant at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting and clarifying. And so 
What I'd like to ask next is you've all given us these big ideas, which are just wonderful, but I'm curious how you see these ideas in relation to each other. And I think Kathleen, you were just gesturing towards that a bit, but especially when we think of 1920 as a moment. In particular, I'd like to ask you about the overlapping borders and exclusions that were facilitated by the 19th Amendment. And I'm curious whether you see this drawing of boundaries as integral to each other, as mutually constituting, or as just unfolding in parallel. So what, if anything, connected this drawing of national borders, sovereign borders, and carceral borders, or to put it another way, the nation, the reservation, the jail as bounded spaces? Um, Kathleen, I'm Curious if you could answer that first, please. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. It, this is a borders show. Um, May mentioned um, that some non citizens had been able to vote, but really that ends with World War I. Um, this is also, right, the fact that um, 1924 is both when the Indian Citizenship Act was passed, but also. Um, the citizen, uh, the Immigration Act that, um, you know, extends the Chinese restrictions to all Asians um, and really uh, bounds um, who can even immigrate to the United States and become a citizen, right? So it's this moment where um, there is a, again, Native people are included in the citizenry, um, finally, uh, fully, but other people continue to be excluded. Um, and also Native people are included, but only so far as those boundaries of the reservations, which um, could be carceral, right? You um, Native people were not allowed to necessarily leave them without permission, um, but it also maintained their land base. And so as those um, reservation boundaries were uh, erased with uh, also uh, took away the protections on indigenous lands. And so, uh, you know, the efforts to assimilate Native people into this citizenry is happening at precisely the same moment that that citizenry is being, um, you know, bounded in other ways. Um, I, you know, I think there's a question here. Um, I, I appreciate Kathleen's um, uh, comment or, or her, her description of Native women who were looking for a kind of layered citizenship, um, uh, a non-binary uh, way of belonging. Um, but I, I think in some ways, in my mind, um, the status of Indigenous peoples is different because they did have sovereignty. And you could look at the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 as an act of inclusion, or you could see it as the last nail in the coffin of sovereignty. And so I am actually sympathetic to those people who didn't want to vote, who didn't want to give legitimacy to the elimination of their sovereign their sovereign rights, even as abridged as they were, um, they, they still had. And so this goes to another question, I think, which is concepts like sovereignty and citizenship in many ways are abstractions. Right, it's an abstract concept, which on the ground has many such really diverse meanings and contradictory meanings, because on the ground, individuals are not all equal; they're not treated equally. Um, this is what we learned from uh, Professor Haley's talk. Right, black people are citizens, but there's a million and one ways that that citizenship is nullified and voided. So I think that when we when we have very high concepts like the nation, sovereignty, citizenship, we always have to look past them. We always have to look at what's happening on the ground and how they are informed by all other kinds of um, dynamics of power. Yeah. May, that's such a good point. Thank you for reminding us of that. Um, and with that, it's now time to hear from the other presenters. So it is my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Rita Siegel. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation to join this uh, amazing series. Um, so I'm going to situate us in uh, 1920 and uh, summon the 19th Amendment's passage, um, a time of uh, a great victory, uh, but also a step uh, and was appreciated as such by contemporaries. 
Um, we know that uh, uh, black women yet could not vote in many states and many contemporaries appreciated that casting a ballot alone could not confer equal citizenship on women. So I'm going to look at the situation over the shoulder of Crystal Eastman, a prominent suffragist of the era, who announced at that point in time, now at last we can begin. And in 1920, she greeted uh, ratification of the 19th Amendment by urging the National Women's Party to employ the vote to secure what she called women's freedom in the feminist sense. But the question is, what was women's freedom in the feminist sense? We often tell a story in which the movement foundered on a choice in 1920 between sameness and difference. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Alice Paul led the National Women's Party to advocate for an equal rights amendment, equality as sameness, in which, which Florence Kelly and others opposed in the name of equality as difference. They argued that an ERA would threaten protective labor legislation on which working women with family care obligations then depended. And the suffrage movement split over this question along class and race lines, not to reunite for 40 years. In fact, Crystal Eastman supported an ERA on critically different terms than Alice Paul did. Eastman sought legal and cultural change to alter the very framework in which women could demand recognition as individuals and inclusion as equal citizens. As Eastman de described in her speech, now we can begin, the vote was only a step in attaining freedom, which in the feminist sense, which Eastman saw as involving a transformation in family relations, in work and sex roles that would unfold both inside and outside the household. And she presented the National Women's Party uh, with a broad four-part plan, which included the, the following planks an end to barriers in, uh, to women's employment. Uh, she worked with Henrietta Rodman and other women in the Feminist Alliance to, on some of the first anti-discrimination legislation, including to protect pregnant and new mothers uh, from exclusion in the workplace. Um, she called for a revolution in the early training of boys and girls, urging that we must, quote, bring up feminist sons. She called for voluntary motherhood, arguing, quote, birth control is, quote, essential to freedom of occupational choice, and also as elementary as equal pay. And she called for a motherhood endowment, advocating state support for those who are raising children so that they wouldn't be dependent on men. So consider how Eastman's proposals sought to change law and norms structuring social reproduction, both inside and outside the family. As I show in an essay entitled The 19th Amendment and the Democratization of the Family, Eastman's proposal, her speech, is continuing actually a long running tradition of argument that reaches all the way back into the suffrage movement of the 19th century. Democratization shows that the quest for the vote was actually an effort to transform women's roles in the family in multiple ways. From the decades um, before the Civil War, reaching forward to the 20th century and really up to the present, women's movements, and I'll say that plural because they are plural, seeking equal citizenship have contested laws that organize family relations and the work of social reproduction. Uh, back in the 19th century, women argued that women were not virtually represented through their husbands and fathers, as men argued. Men lacked authority to speak for women, and the laws they enacted didn't reflect women's interests as laws that structured the family they pointed to, to illustrate. To the contrary, the law structuring the family, suffragists argued, illustrated women's need for the vote. And in the 19th century, there were a whole tradition of arguments pointing to the need for law to change uh, and emancipate and give to women rights in their family labor. There were also claims for voluntary motherhood, which at that point meant a wife's right to say no to sex. By the early 1900s, some advocated for, let's say, physical means of contraception, uh, yet others focused on questions of family care. Uh, Mary Church Terrell, founder of the National Association of Colored Women we've heard about today, campaigned for public kindergartens, nurseries, and childcare two decades before she picketed the White House for the vote. So Eastman's four-part plan was tapping into this long-running tradition. While Alice Paul, in fact, 
led the Women's Party in repudiating Eastman's plan of action and went on to seek an ERA to seek equal treatment without structural change, <clears throat> Eastman's pro uh, approach was in fact renewed at the 19th Amendment's half century anniversary in 1970. When women coalesced around the ERA in 1970 at the half century anniversary of the suffrage, we can see a picture of change which actually has roots in the, the claims that uh, Eastman sketched out. At that time, a women's strike for equality, led by Betty Friedan and Eileen Hernandez, the first presidents of the National Organization for Women, put forward an ERA claim replete with claims for structural change. There were three demands at the women's strike, access then for abortion, for universal childcare, and for equal opportunity in education and employment. Eleanor Holmes Norton then uh, which uh, uh, emphasized at the time in her words that a prohibition of sex discrimination in employment was, quote, an empty mandate unless women have a place in which they can have find care for their children. So it's an echoing of this kind of argument that we saw. In the aftermath of the strike, which then was the largest uh, until the 2017 Women's March, we know that Congress passed the ERA and 30 states ratified it. We know the story about the enforcement of anti-discrimination and action on abortion, but it's often forgotten that both houses of Congress actually passed the CCDA, the Comprehensive Child Care Development Act, which however, uh, Nixon vetoed. He sided with a rising uh, set of conservatives when he claimed that broadly accessible childcare would diminish parental, the mother's involvement with children. Uh, attacking child care and quote unquote women's lib, Phyllis Schlafly helped block ratification of the ERA by its 82 deadline. It's often forgotten that she was involved with the opposition to child care. So finishing off, we're now 100 years since women run the, won the vote and we're not yet secure in exercising the freedoms hoped for in 1920 and demanded in the 70s. Insecurity perhaps most painfully visible on the issue of child care. The COVID pandemic makes clear how our failure to support childcare has harmed women and anyone who cares for dependent family members or dependent persons. So for these reasons, I guess we can say that the 19th Amendment's promise of equal citizenship remains unfinished business until we create an infrastructure that helps alleviate and distribute and redistribute the burdens of care and dependent persons' cares across genders and in the community beyond family. For seven decades, the battle for women's suffrage was also a battle to bring democracy to family life. A century later, key elements of that goal remain unmet. Eastman might ask, will it take another 100 years to remedy that failure? So it's now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor back to Christina. Hello. Well, here we are in 2020. It's the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and I think we were expecting to celebrate. And um, the fact is, I haven't seen a lot of joy. The mood on the centennial is rather somber, sometimes reproachful. I've seen a number of articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post. I've heard stories on NPR, even, even read in the Smithsonian, stories that remind us that the 19th Amendment, though securing the vote for some women, it not by no means did it secure the vote for all. As for the iconic suffragist Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we read that they were morally, uh, you know, suspect, perhaps racist, uh, elitist. The idea is perhaps their feminism was really simply catered to the needs of, of bourgeois, middle-class white women. Even the 1948 Women's Convention in Seneca Falls is under a cloud. Now, there is nothing wrong with skeptical or irreverent attitudes uh, towards historical figures. Um, in fact, in my own work, uh, I have questioned the origin story of the 19th Amendment and suggested that conservative women played a, a greater role than uh, they're usually uh, said to have done. So as I review the state of scholarship on the centennial about historical figures, about the event, 
Um, I worry that in our focus on everything that went wrong, we have lost sight of much that went spectacularly right. And I think that cynicism and pessimism can distort our understanding of the past as much as a naive sort of romanticization or valorization. Consider the current animus that I find in a lot of the scholarship and certainly uh, in the media, there's a lot of animus towards Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Now these two women were both lifelong abolitionists. They were fervent defenders of universal rights. They were nationally famous for their struggle uh, to get to improve the status of women. I mean, they were, you, it's almost hard to overstate how much they did this sustained production of articles and books and speeches and lobbying and organizing. Um, Anthony was so well known that the newspapers just uh, called her Susan B in their, in their headlines. After the Civil War, Susan B. Anthony, Katie Stanton, they fully expected that Congress was going to grant women the vote. To their dismay, that didn't happen. The 15th Amendment was limited to black men. Women, black and white, were going to have to wait. And for these two lifelong suffragists, this was such, they felt so betrayed uh, and let down uh, that they refused to support the amendment. Now, both of them, especially Stanton, used just inexcusably bigoted language uh, to express her disapproval. Their dear old friend, Frederick Douglass, was horrified by the way they were behaving and the words they used. So were many of their sister suffragists. Uh, their anger and intransigence split the suffrage movement, and it would take many years before it would come back together. But keep this in mind. This was a bitter quarrel among progressive humanitarian reformers. It was a, a family quarrel. Uh, I don't want to get too far into the weeds about this quarrel. There are some, there's been some very good scholarship around it. I, my favorite is probably uh, Faye Dunn's Fighting Chance, the struggle over women's suffrage and black suffrage and reconstruction. But bear in mind that Sojourner Truth took the side of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and that Frederick Douglass eventually forgave them, or he certainly forgave Susan, I mean, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I visited the Douglas House recently in Washington, and her uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's portrait is still there in his parlor as it was when, when he was alive. Now, for the record, Frederick Douglass deployed outrageous ethnic stereotypes about Native Americans when he made his arguments in favor of suffrage for, for Black men. Now, we, we don't, should we cancel him or demote him? problematize Frederick Douglass. I mean, I think we should honor him and learn from his example. And um, not because he was a saint, he wasn't, but he was one of the most formidable champions of human rights in American history. And the same is true of Anthony and Stanton. Now, it's possible that, I mean, sometimes I think that because they are women, maybe we're applying harsher and more stringent and unforgivable standards. Now, they led a world-changing movement for nearly half a century, but they're now being judged by their worst moments. But in this sea of sort of scholarly and journalistic denunciation, I found one writer, ta Coates, who took the time to review the entire record. And uh, he writes, I find myself in sympathy with both Stanton and Anthony. He rejects the idea that they were any sort of white supremacists. And he notes that they spent a good part of their early careers devoted to the cause of black people. Yes, they made mistakes, he says, but they were, and this is a quote, they were always pushing, always agitating, always expanding, and I can feel strong kinship. I don't need my personal pantheon to be clean. 
but I need it to be filled with warriors. Well, they were formidable warriors. They waged their battle for women's rights for so long on so many fronts and so effectively that I, I think they've earned their place in the human rights pantheon that would include Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth and Martin Luther King. Now, I'm not saying that, look, let me put it this way. Scholars shouldn't exaggerate the achievements or the moral perfections of historical figures. That's, that's wrong and it's a distortion. But the answer is not to go the other direction and overstate their failures. And I see that happening with some of the leading suffragists. I see it happening with the way we're celebrating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So on this anniversary, I think there is certainly still a lot of work to be done. And I think there's much to lament about the past, but let's not forget, there's a lot to be grateful for and it would be wrong not to celebrate. Thank you. And I will pass the floor to the virtual floor to Don Teal. Thank you very much. I'm going to share some slides. Give me one second to pull them up. Okay, my brief talk is going to be about the unfinished business of the 19th Amendment. So this is what I call a listogram, which presents the historical distribution of women's enfranchisement around the world. On the x-axis, you have decade bins, and on the y-axis, you have the number of countries that enfranchised women in each decade. So we know that the first wave of suffrage began somewhere close to 1900, really coming to the fore, uh, just surrounding the First World War. The USA is, is boxed there, and you can see that we are not the leader, but are in the middle of the pack. And then after that, we have a big wave of suffrage after the Second World War, and then again uh, around the 1980s with decolonization and the establishment of many new nations. The fact that the United States is not a leader is going to be a, uh, a leitmotif in my talk today. So like many other countries in the first wave, there was a large, robust social movement for women's suffrage in the United States that was notable not only for the uh, innovative tactics they used in terms of rallies, petitioning, and they were the first to ever picket the White House, but also for the exclusions uh, that were um, that you know, we just heard about from, from Christina Summers, um, the exclusions of women of color and of native women from many of the um, more public uh, and private conversations in, in the movement. What I wanna talk about today is more of a report card on the 19th Amendment. So suffrage was understood by many of its foremost activists as a means to an end of greater representation of women's interests in politics. Um, as in many other countries, the 19th Amendment in the United States allowed for broad-based exclusions of poor and minority women, as we saw with Jim Crow laws in the South. But the two things that I'm going to talk about today are that the 19th Amendment did not encourage broad-based participation of women thereafter, and it did not guarantee women's representation in politics more generally. So this here is a graph that plots what we know about women's enfranchisement beginning in the year, of the, the first year in which women were entitled to vote in a handful of European um, countries with the United States marked by red. And what you can see is that with the exception of Iceland, where there was very low participation of women in the early elections, the United States lagged far behind in terms of turnout among eligible women voters. So women in Austria, about 80% of those eligible to vote voted from the very first elections. And in many of the other European countries, it was closer to 60% of eligible voters. The, the punchline here, which I'm going to come back to, is that the rest of those countries, with the exception of Iceland, employed proportional representation as a form of um, taking votes and allocating them to seats. And that's going to be important for the, for the long-term legacy as well. Today, women's rates of turnout in the United States are very high, higher than men's for every ethnic group, except for Hispanic women. Um, white women are numerically the largest group in the electorate by a long shot, followed by white men. But as you note, after 2008, black women's turnout begins to surpass turnout of white women. Um, 
So women are very active in politics in a variety of dimensions. Turnout is only is only one version of that. But the interesting thing is that in spite of relatively high rates of turnout since the 1980s and parity since more or less the 1940s with men, um, especially among white women, women remain dramatically underrepresented in all of our institutions of power. So this is just giving you a sense of the House of Representatives and the Senate and the blue line are, is the Democratic Party and the red line is the Republican Party. And you can see that until the late 1980s, somewhere around the 100th Congress, there were very few women in office uh, at all. And by far, the, the most women are members of the Democratic Party. So the number one thing for increasing women's representation in the United States is increasing women's representation in the Republican Party, which uh, tends to elect very low numbers of women to both the House and the Senate. In terms of our place in the world, the United States lags behind the global average. Um, as you can see here, this is plotting the share of women in the lower houses around the world by region. And we have the Nordic countries in the lead. They, most of them use proportional representation. The Americas writ large, all of our neighbors to the South, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa. And actually we have surpassed the Asian countries after the, after the midterm elections, we surpassed the countries in Asia. So the United States is not a global leader in terms of women's um, representation. And I wanna talk a little bit about why that's the case. So the most important thing is that the institutions of the United States prevent more equal representation. So although women's turnout uh, has eclipsed men's, the presence of winner takes all rules where we elect a single member out of the congressional districts, as opposed to proportional representation, where you allocate votes over a larger geographic space and then give to parties based on the proportional um, the proportional support that they got in a larger geographic district. That contributes to women's low levels of representation in part because of the method of voting. The second thing that's contributing to women's heightened representation around the world is electoral quotas. Electoral quotas are more often adopted in PR countries and they dramatically change the descriptive representation among women. So I want everybody, I know I'm running out of time, but I want everybody to take one minute and ask yourself the following question. How many countries do you think have adopted electoral quotas? Make a note in your brain. More than 130 countries around the world, there are something like 208 countries presently that are recognized by the UN. More than 130 countries around the world have adopted electoral quotas. Countries with proportional representation and electoral quotas elect way more women and they have way more parties and experience less effective uh, polarization than we have in the United States. So the suffrage movement that I want us all to think about for this century, in the short term, we have to work to secure voting rights for all. For many of the reasons that my colleagues have uh, presented today, um, there continue to be large scale disenfranchisement and exclusion, not only legally, but also just in terms of the, just in fact, uh, because people can't cast a ballot very long, um, very long lines in many urban areas um, and lack of information uh, can often lead to the un undercounting of votes as well. In the long term, I think we have to work to change the electoral rules in this country to move towards proportional representation at the state level first before we work towards it at the national level. So uh, the Congress is more proportional. The Senate is obviously dramatically malapportioned, but at the state level, if we work for proportional representation where representation better reflects geographic density, that can help us decrease polarization and increase women's representation around the country. So for more on these ideas, you can see my book. But now it is my pleasure to hand it back to Corey Field. Wow, uh, so much to think about. Uh, I wanna thank the three of you for helping us to understand this transformative potential in the amendment and how much unfinished business there is and the hope that we can move that business along for what Dawn called the suffrage movement for this century, a uh, great place to kick us towards. I do wanna start though by asking you exactly the same question that I asked the first group and giving you a chance to imagine yourselves on that congressional committee proposing a revision 
vision that would help to uh, expand the possibilities for how we understand public life. And I'm curious what you would do. Uh, Riva, may I start with you, please, and pass the floor to you? Well, I'm going to answer, um, since I know we need to move quickly, I will say that um, it would be uh, great to move from a model of protecting votes against discrimination on account of race or sex to affirmative protection for the right to vote as a basic model. Um, and that's the direction in which we need to move to have a federal right to vote. That's my first point. My second point is um, to say, consistent with my remarks, that this long <clears throat> multi-generational uh, mobilization for vindication of representation was about more than voting only, and that its best interpretation or vindication in the Constitution should be, um, we should understand it uh, along with the other amendments, reconstruction amendments. So I want to invoke it not just as a mechanism for uh, vindicating voting, but as a piece of constitutional text that needs to be read up with our other constitutional texts. And to do that, I want to in invite conversation about what it would mean to read them together as having meanings read together. In, so we might call that synthetic. And that's a conversation we can push forward perhaps. So those are two different kinds of answers. Great, Christina, would you like to weigh in on that as well, please, on rewriting the amendment? And you're muted. Could you please unmute yourself? Mute, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, am I unmuted? Yeah. You are. So how would you oh. <laughs> rewrite this amendment? You know, I looked at the amendment and I just thought, why did they write it that way? You know, they, they, they said that the federal government would prohibit, you know, that states couldn't prohibit people from voting on the basis of sex, but they didn't guarantee the right to vote. But then I realized no one would have thought to have an amendment that would guarantee everyone the right to vote. It wasn't uh, the way that it worked. It, it would have uh, arrogated power to the federal government, uh, which, which for some reason the Founding Fathers didn't include the vote as a basic right. It was sort of seen as a privilege. And so I don't think we can go back and change what they did. But I think we have changed it and are changing it and turning it into a right. And I want to continue with that struggle. But to answer the question, I... I don't think it would have been possible to get it passed any other way. It was hard enough as it was. Dawn, what about you, please? Well, I, unlike May, I, I think that um, I wouldn't have stricken the word citizens from it because I think that the federal government has an interest, obviously, in, in regulating the lives of citizens, but I am, am in favor of more federal oversight in what the states do, because I think that although they can be laboratories of experiments, they can also be laboratories of repression. And so to me, I would like a more positive, um, a more positive guarantee of the right. So the right of, like citizens have a right to vote regardless of sex, age, race, well, not age, but race, et cetera. They might lower the age in San Francisco to 16. <laughs> yes. if, if we're being historians, if we're asking about the 20s, then, you know, Martha Jones or Paula Monopoly or others will tell us that race was the reason why. But if we're asking ourselves today, what would we do? Then we can talk about the urgent need to have a federal right to an affirmative right to vote. Um, and so that's a conversation to have. And Riva, can you carry up that conversation? Because this is one of the questions from the audience, right? And Christina's told us it's about federalism, perhaps it's about race. But why why was there this negative formulation in both the 15th and the 19th Amendments instead of a protection of the right to vote? Well, I mean, if we're going to start the story, I, you know, I, I've raised race, but uh, to go back to what Christina and Dawn and others are saying, at the founding, voting is a privilege, not a right. 
we today talk about uh, a notion of a vote as being uh, equally shared by every adult member of the polity, but uh, now we're assuming borders and boundaries may, we can have, this is a conversation we can have, but if we're talking at the founding, we're talking a world in which uh, there, it's a privilege by some to exert power over others or to represent others. So head of household is uh, speaking for dependent members. So it would be uh, husband, wife, master, servant. It would be a property, property holder. And that's uh, an element of design. It's, it's just the way in which you know, you can speak about the United States as a constitutional democracy, which relative to the antecedent experiments in government was infinitely more democratic than its predecessors, but relative to current expectations was not so very democratic. You know, it's just sort of what's the, the comparator, right? So to compare it to present expectations, it was horrifically under uh, representing. Uh, and I see May wants to come in, so I want to let her in. Well, I just want to say that there's two different issues here. Um, one is, uh, you know, should voting be a right? Is it a, should it be a right or a privilege? Um, another is this question of uh, what the Constitution and, and its amendments say, um, and especially with the uh, 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment also is written as it's not, you don't have a right, it's, it's a negative thing, right? It's that no state can abridge the rights of persons. And that's, that's so the point I was trying to make is that in the constitution, we don't make a big distinction between citizens and persons. In fact, citizenship is never defined in the constitution. You cannot find the definition of citizenship. The closest you get is that Congress shall make a law uh, for naturalization. And the Constitution speaks of privileges and immunities of citizenship, but it never defines them explicitly. And the only other place you have citizenship come up in the Constitution is that um, you have to be a citizen, uh, you have to be a natural born citizen to, um, to be president of the United States. So the Constitution, as far as rights go, um, speaks of persons. It speaks of persons. And that's the point I'm gonna make, is that to say that the right to vote should not be limited citizens is not, in my mind, outlandish because that is the model of uh, rights of persons in, in the U.S. Constitution. It sounds outlandish to our ears today, but in fact, I don't think we should look at it that way. Um, but when we're talking about this conversation and we're having this conversation historically, uh, not only do we have national borders, we have the federal state dynamic, which is... Um, I mean, I'm not sure that we want to go down this direction, but um, there, there were even movements to repeal the 15th Amendment in the lead up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And there are just so many deep ways in which um, the sort of struggle over um, sort of disfranchisement of African-Americans in the South and anxiety about enfranchising African Americans through the 19th Amendment was so deep a part of, of this story um, that you know we can talk and ideal. It's very hard to know what terrain this conversation is on. Are we talking at the founding? Are we talking in 1920? Are we talking in ideal terms? Or you know, it, and so, but if we're just talking about where the conversation sat at the point of um, uh, ratification in in 1920, it was in the middle of uh, extreme conflict over. Uh, the question of who would be able to vote in Southern states being tangled up with the question of women's suffrage in ways that I think prior, I don't know whether to call this episodes, chapters of this series have explored, you know. Um, I think so. that's such a great point. I mean, one of the things that you all pointed out is the way the vote is related to other concepts that are also changing at the time. And um, I did want to get to negative. The, the negative formulation is leaving to the states control of right. the suffrage, right? Yes. And that's the that's the place where we're still stuck. We have yes. still not fully, you know, the Voting Rights Act of 65 begins to create more of a federal presence, but there's still this ambiguity of who's in charge. And mm -hmm. um, that's just a huge, long conversation. And right. is it going to be federal presence to end discrimination or is it going to be federal affirmative protection of a right to vote? 
And, and don't forget one thing, that politicians are always worried about how the newly enfranchised population is going to vote. Are they going to vote them out of office? And so you had a, for just a lot, when we made, you know, Alaska a state and Hawaii a state, it was, it was also a political balance because people, Republicans thought they'd get Alaska and the Democrats thought they'd win the Hawaiian votes. It turned out to be so. And there was a lot of, a lot of this calculation was going on at the time of, in all the debates about, about uh, suffrage. People wanted to stay in office. Yeah. That actually builds to another question from an audience member who asks about um, disenfranchisement in Puerto Rico and writes, I understand that although they are citizens in Puerto Rico, they're not protected by the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and they're not able to vote in presidential elections. And I wondered if maybe Kathleen or May or you, K Kathleen, do you know anything about Puerto Rico in your book? I don't actually talk about Puerto Rico in the book, um, but, uh, you know, just to, to basically say that they're not covered, right, women in Puerto Rico, well, Puerto Ricans were granted U.S. citizenship in 1917, uh, but women, Puerto Rican women are not covered um, under the 19th Amendment. They don't get the right to vote, and it's a much longer um, struggle, and initially the it's a focus on educated women's suffrage. Um, it's not until 1935 um, that uh, that is removed and all women in Puerto Rico can access the ballot. Um, but yeah, there are still those um, restrictions on Puerto Rico uh, voting in national elections. And of course, as a territory, not having um, uh, you know, they have a, a delegate in Congress, but not official representation. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, there's questions. Can I just add? Can I just add yes, that? please. I think the thing about um, Puerto Rico that's, that's interesting is that uh, Puerto Ricans do, uh, do have citizenship uh, under the Jones Act of 1917, but it's not constitutional citizenship. It's a statutory grant of citizenship which can be taken away. So in addition to um, what Kathleen was pointing out, that they don't have the right to run a national election for the president or they have no congressional representation, their citizenship is also much more precarious. Really interesting. So the, you talked about structural change, and there is a question here that's phrased, doesn't the vote give power to elect candidates who can create change. And I guess I want to ask this, so women got the vote, sort of so what question, and Kathleen mentioned briefly the fear of uh, Native Americans as a voting block. I'm wondering if any of the rest of you see voting blocks or another way that the vote did or didn't create change, and Dawn, maybe you should kick us off on that question as our political scientist. Well, I hear part of the question as being, so can't we get change with the vote that we have now under the current system? And I would just say that the biggest problem is that in this majoritarian system, there aren't incentives to have new political ideas because with winner takes all rules, there's only an incentive to have two parties. Anytime a third party enters, one of the other parties wants to suck it up and suck up their constituents so that you can get 51% to win. And I think that that makes change extremely hard. It also gives um, a lot of power to incumbents versus power to you know legislatures or parties to change their internal practices to make things more representative. So you know if anybody has seen Borgen, it's a it's quite an interesting show. Uh, for a variety of reasons that, that infuriate me, but one of the good things about it is it really puts into perspective like what, what's different in parliamentary politics, namely that you have to have a coalition government, you know, in most cases. And on the one hand, that can be bad if you want to do all the policies your own way, but on the other hand, I think it has a moderating kind of influence on um, the, the leadership. And so I would say, you know, the, the, the electoral system we have is resistant to change. So Christina, what, what do you think? Joy and always pushing and expanding. So, so women got the vote. So what? What do you see as the transformation there? Well, it was slow. What was interesting is, well, it was fascinating that women organized around 
their own empowerment in, in the voting booth, in the, the anti-suffrage women. And then afterwards, rel relatively few women vote. It took a long time. And um, that's, I think, to understand, to get into the minds of women that would oppose the vote or not take advantage of it, they didn't have the habits of citizenship in that sense. And voting was, sometimes it was done in saloons. It was associated with just, a, you know, a, a very ruckus environment. It was thought, you know, women shouldn't be there. And so all of that, we had to wait for those changes and they certainly came. I mean, I think what I see is sort of amazing today is that across ethnic and racial lines, more women than men do vote. And women, if women organize, they can get what they want. I didn't have time to go into it today, but in some of my work on the suffrage movement <coughs> and women's history, when conservative and, and progressive women get together, they don't even have to like each other, they don't have to get, but when they get together for a common cause, they can do it, almost anything. And this is where women have made the greatest progress educationally, politically, at those periods where there were, they listened to one another. And um, I hope we can get back to that where <laughs> we have a civilized political discourse and people start to listen, but we seem a little far now. <laughs> So, Christina, I would hope for that, too. And also, you <laughs> helped trans, um, transition us into what I think is the next question. It could even potentially be one of the last questions because it's a big one. And I'm just going to read it. It says, what can we do as a practical matter now, and that's in caps, to advance women's rights? And Kathleen, I wonder if you would want to speak to that first and then May, and then we will see what time we have. Sorry, the mute button. Um, I mean, that's uh, a, part of it is just for those people who can exercise the right to vote um, and don't face uh, um, they need to be voting, right? We have low voter turnout among young people. Um, and so people who can vote should be voting. Um, someone mentioned, right, when will you, U.S. think of voting as a civic duty, right? Um, and I think that's important. Uh, but we we really need to fix um, the Voting Rights Act, right, the Shelby v. Holder um, stripped. And I think, um, you know, part of our conversation today has revolved around this question of the right to vote and how do we guarantee that everyone has access to the right to vote and that these really um, difficult, you know, the ways in which some states make it extremely difficult to vote, um, we've got to fight against those. We've got to get rid of that and make it easy. And once again, much like women's suffrage, I think looking to the example of states in the West, um, you know, where voter registration happens when you get your driver's license, the ballot, your absentee ballot comes to you, you don't have to request it, you have time to consider the issues and research them. I think that's a great model. And, um, you know, hopefully these, as laboratories of democracy, as Don said, um, that that will spread. Well, we are living in an extraordinary moment. Um, it's a frightening moment. And um, uh, I think a lot will, will hinge on, on this coming election. I think a lot is at stake uh, in terms of uh, American democracy, even as um, troubled and imperfect as it is. Um, uh, we face, I think, the prospect of an authoritarian uh, government uh, in this country. And uh, we know that uh, women fare poorly in all authoritarian regimes. Uh, women's rights are, um, they are many things, but they are democratic rights among other principles. Uh, women's rights are really only possible women's equality, women's rights uh, to um, justice and to a good life um, are um, only, they are, they are not possible without democracy. So I think um, to advance women's rights, we have to protect that democracy. We have to have everybody who can vote to vote and to protect our votes. Um, but I think this is, uh, this is an extraordinary time. But I also think it's a time where we can uh, have some hope because 
as my colleagues have said, women um, are a voting block in many ways. I mean, women women poll differently than men. Women have different opinions than men. I mean, not every single person, obviously, but in the aggregate. So I think women can make a difference um, uh, in this election. And I think they will. Wow, that's yes, great. I, I want to. Uh, Go ahead, Amaya. I want to agree that we have to preserve this precious democracy that's important for, for women, for everyone. And part of that is teaching our kids to appreciate it, to understand it, to know these, how hard fought these liberties we take for granted truly are and how easily they can be taken away. So I think right now, Overall, I think the first and second wave feminist movements are pretty much a, you know, astonishing success story. There's work to be done, but certainly for educated women, there are, you know, few women anywhere in the world with the sorts of opportunities and, and you know, freedoms uh, that American women, educated women have today. I do see problems, serious problems, of, of social class in our educational system and holding people back and they are not going to be avail, able to avail themselves of the and to flourish in this society if we don't attend to education and preserve the possibility for upward mobility. Christina, thank you for um, bringing us to a close with that thought, because I think that certainly points to some of the unfinished business that we all have ahead of us. So um, I hope that you have found uh, this panel as inspiring as I have, that you will all go and vote. Um, yes. <laughs> and I just want to say that uh, this concludes our program today. And I want to say thank you again to our panelists for your very thoughtful presentations and perspectives. Uh, what an intellectual feast we've had. And I also want to thank our audience for the terrific questions. And many thanks as well to the Andrew Mellon Foundation, whose support has made this conference and Radcliffe's multi-year exploration of gender and voting rights possible. I hope you'll be able to participate in our future Radcliffe virtual programs, including the continuation of our virtual conference, Voting Matters, Gender, Citizenship, and the Long 19th Amendment. A full list of the remaining conference sessions will appear on your screen momentarily, and you can also be found on Radcliffe's website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. Finally, I hope you will visit the Long 19th Amendment online portal, which can also be accessed through the Radcliffe website. The portal is an open access digital platform that includes a fascinating digital exhibition curated by Alison Lang entitled Seeing Citizens, Picturing American Women's Fight for the Vote. Uh, don't miss it. So thank you again for joining us today and please take care. <laughs>